we move on to the afternoon session now. And uh, Professor Cosentino passed me on the, the microphone uh, for the chairmanship. So it will be my, my pleasure to introduce the next speaker of this session, uh, Professor Howard Gendelman. Professor Gendelman uh, is, a, is a professor at the University of Nebraska uh, Medical Center. And um, um, I think he's, a, he's, a, he's a probably the best qualified, or one of, I mean, of the best qualified speakers for, the, for the, an, a neuroimmune uh, um, school because he's been a leader in the field of neurovirology, neuroinflammation, and neuropharmacology, and particularly uh, in the field of neurodegenerative uh, diseases. Uh, he's been working first as a postdoctoral fellow of the John Hopkins Medical Center, and uh, he's done a lot of work specifically on the um, HIV uh, virus. He has um, demonstrated, for example, that in addition to CB, CD4 plus T, T cells, HIV can be isolated directly from uh, uh, blood cells. Uh, so he has given uh, a fundamental contribution uh, to, this, uh, to this field. And lately, he has been uh, uh, interested in using monocytes and macrophages in uh, vehicles for uh, delivery, uh, so nano drug uh, or nano uh, systems delivery uh, for, uh, for drugs in the, the nervous system, which I think is uh, one of the uh, issues that he will be talking about uh, this afternoon. He's also editor in chief of the Journal of Neuroimmune Pharmacology and uh, editor also of the test book of neuroimmune pharmacology. So uh, it will be a, a pleasure to hear from uh, Professor Gendelman uh, a lot of uh, new and interesting things. Thank you. Take this. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you, uh, Fabio and, and Marco. I uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for allowing me to ask silly questions. Uh, and thank you for teaching me uh, Italian. So I, I do know uh, two words now. And by the end, I'm going to know three. I'm really working my way up. And I, uh, I, the hospitality and the warmth, the interactions, and uh, the content, the scientific direction has been uh, enormously successful and has helped me in thinking about the field of neuroimmune pharmacology. And I, I just want to start, before I get into a whole bunch of data, and say that uh, last night, um, till the wee hours of my morning and the uh, late afternoon uh, in the US, uh, I was fighting with the president of our society. We, there's a society of neuroimmune pharmacology. Um, and I said, what is neuroimmune pharmacology? What is it? Uh, when we started, it was an issue of opiates and drugs of abuse affecting lymphocyte function and immunosuppression, as you know, or many know. And later on, it became a, a modulatory uh, ways to look at uh, neurodegenerative and neuroinflammatory disease where you affect blood-brain barrier migration of leukocytes, you look at inflammatory response, modulate the adaptive or innate immunity, you may affect stem cells and stem cell migration, and then ultimately look at drug delivery as a whole cadre of any of this. But um, he said, no, that's absolutely wrong. When you look at this, you have to look at cell signaling and inflammatory response is much more global. And then I thought about uh, the issue and the vice president of the society said, look, um, you have to really think about Italy. He looked at the schedule and the events, but what you have to ignore is the economy. Just ignore the Italian economy and just look at the Italian science. As you can do that, uh, you'll be very, very good. So, I'm sorry, that was supposed to be funny, but I guess it wasn't. We're all struggling, but don't worry, because America is very much ahead of Italy in bad economy. So, we're, we have you beat. Uh, we've been there for about 35 years, so it should not be a, a major problem. What I, what I want to talk about today um, is something very new and, and something that we're very excited about and, and I believe we'll hear more of as the days and weeks go on. We, we know vis-a-vis uh, -vis adaptive immunity, 
or innate immunity. We know that the immune system in the brain and outside the brain can do many things. And usually, when it's a pro-inflammatory uh, signature, it does bad things. And we try to modulate it. We try to dampen it. We try to transform it. We try to affect migration of cells so it doesn't enhance. And then we look at downstream at all the pathophysiological effects that are causal of this change in immune response from whatever the insult, whatever the organ, and whatever the disease. But one thing that we haven't thought about is whether we can take the natural immune system and use it as a vehicle. A vehicle meaning use it as a means as an, to an end. In this case, deliver drugs or therapeutics and bypass the blood-brain barrier, bypass the mucosal barriers, and look at means to more signature, more specifically target therapeutic entities or therapeutic endpoints to where the drug is needed most. And we call this signature medicine or directed therapeutic uh, nanomedicine. So we're going to talk about that uh, now. Now, I always love to show this slide for students. How many students do are in the audience? Oh, just me? OK, a couple in the back. OK, I, many, many years ago, uh, this goes back about 25 years ago, uh, I was a student uh, as well. And I was invited to a conference that was beginning to talk about the role of macrophage migration and monocyte, uh, even the early dendritic cell story. And a professor, Professor Ralph Steinman, many of you know him, he won the Nobel Prize this year and discovered the role of dendritic cells. And he had the first conference on macrophages and HIV. And the concept was at that time, in 1988 or 87, the concept was that this was not simply a T-cell lymphotropic virus. It used to be called the human T-cell lymphotropic virus type 3, or LAV. Uh, but it may, in fact, be, in primary sense, a macrophage. Now, why is a macrophage something foreign vis-a-vis -a, -vis a viral pathogen or many microbes? Because the macrophage has a lot of things, a lot of abilities in its repertoire to contain and destroy and affect ongoing microbial infection. What can it do? Well, it has phagocytic capabilities. It has lysosomes. So it can degrade, it can kill, it can transport, it can present antigen, and it could secrete billions, literally billions, of molecules by paracrine and autocrine regulatory loops to affect an immune response that leads to natural killing of a microbe or a microbe associated with a cell or de novo inside the cell itself. So the notion that this same cell could be a harbinger a vehicle for ongoing infection was something very foreign 25 years ago. And this idea came on the cover of the New York Times. I don't know how many people have heard of that. It's uh, an American magazine, uh, maybe not so important. The big one is Playboy, much more important than this. <laughs> I haven't been on the cover of Playboy, by the way. I'm wor working on it. You never know, you know. I'm not that kind of guy, you know. It's a big problem. But I think what's, it's okay. I'm an American. I can get away with it. Uh, but the idea behind this whole uh, concept was the primary role that macrophages may play as conduits. And when the macrophage is infected and reaches these end organs, whether it's the brain, spinal cord, the central nervous system, or ultimately the bone marrow, peripheral tissues, by dysregulation of the macrophage cytokine repertoire and the secretion of bioactive molecules, the macrophage can induce secondary tissue injury. And we saw that, we published that, and this gave rise to a, a field of this whole concept of metabolic neurological disease, metabolic encephalopathy, not caused as a consequence of the microbe infecting a neuron or a glia, but actually disrupt the vascular spaces of the brain 
and an inflammatory response, and then secondarily damaging neurons and inducing an encephalopathy. And that's what this uh, article was, was. And if you look at the early paper that we published in uh, 1986, probably before a number of you were born, maybe not all, just Marco, uh, that the site of active viral replication was, was these multinucleated giant cells, and surrounding these giant cells on the right were reactive astrocytes or reactive microglial cells that were driving an inflammatory response that secondarily was causing neuronal injury and loss. And this really was the early underpinnings of what we see in Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Huntington's, and many neurodegenerative disorders where dysregulation of microglial activation can lead or affect in some uh, manner, either directly or indirectly, to collateral neuronal damage. Now, whether in a, uh, we call it the chicken or the egg, whether that is the cause or a reaction to the injury, we're still 25 years later still struggling with that response or that answer. So, but we learned something from this. This was a, an early paper we published in the Journal of Experimental Medicine. And I remember Ralph Steinman, the few interactions that we had, he was very angry with me after this paper. It came in the same time that this conference was. And he said, you know, I invited you. You're a young postdoc. I invited you to New York at the, uh, and then I find that you're on the front page of the New York Times, the Science Times. Uh, you didn't mention me. You know, I'm the one that invited you. I said, well, someday you're going to be bigger than me. And no. So he won the Nobel Prize, and I got invited to give this talk. So I don't know what's more important, but I think coming to Italy is it's probably more important. Uh, but this was the concept then that the macrophage can act as a Trojan horse. A Trojan horse meaning that the virus itself, you can see the viral particles, would be inside an acidic vesicles and escape immune surveillance. So very little viral proteins were, were on the cell surface. The humoral and even the adaptive immune surveillance would miss these cells or could potentially miss these cells. They could scurry virus or infect a patient to a patient uh, through cell-mediated uh, uh, entry mechanisms. And this was the initial uh, early discussion of a macrophage as a Trojan horse for microbial dissemination. So we reasoned, um, fast forward 25 years later, and we had done a, a lot of work uh, in HIV, in HIV macrophage interactions, in HIV uh, CNS disease and pathobiology. Uh, and years later, we reasoned why couldn't a macrophage act as a drug carrier? Why couldn't we take a particle and make a drug into something that resembled the virus and trick the macrophage in thinking that our antiretroviral or immunomodulatory drug or neuroprotective drug would actually be a microbe. It would be taken up in the same sort of mechanisms. And if it was an antiviral drug, would be subcellular. So it would be targeted within the cytoplasmic organelles to an area where there were active viral replication occurring. So we would have a direct subcellular locale where we would deliver the drug in the exact location where the virus was growing. And we would use the macrophage as a scurrier, as a carrier, to deliver this to the different tissues where virus was replicating, because the macrophage was indeed the major target for the virus itself. So that was our thought going into this. And again, this is relatively young in, in idea, and uh, we hope more people are working on this. I, I think we're maybe one of few in the world that uh, has pursued this, but it, it's something to generate discussion. So we made these particles, we made it resemble a virus. We had the macrophage actively take up these particles. We could fluorescinate it so we can actually measure how well the macrophage was taking it up uh, by the ability in live confocal microscopy for a green macrophage to turn yellow or orange. And we can then take that drug-laden macrophage 
and then every couple days, every five days, infect it with HIV and see how long we can keep the macrophage free of viral replication by a single dose. If we added native drug, in six hours the drug would be washed out and virus would replicate. If we added the nano-formulated viral-looking drug or appearing drug, we reason that it could be up to a month or longer that the cell would be protected against viral infection. And then ultimately work up this through excipients and development, try it in animals, look at viral reservoirs, especially the brain or the spinal cord, to see if we can get these drugs in, because the macrophage had an ability to traverse the blood-brain barrier through chemokine gradients that were inflammatory and drive the anti-disease mechanism similar to what had been driven by the virus to cause disease. So what I prepared is a cartoon to explain what we've done in five years in 22 seconds. Do you think I can do that? And stand on one leg at the same time? No. <laughs> so we're going to go over this. I don't think anyone likes my silly humor. But um, I really didn't want to be a scientist early on. I, I actually wanted to be a comedian, but nobody would hire me. And then I tried to be a spy. Um, but the a spy, a spy, a spy means uh, it's a KGB, you know, some of the CIA. You, but I had a big mouth. I loved to talk. So I couldn't keep a secret. That was another problem that I had. <laughs> OK, so this is a brain. And this is the HIV disease within the central nervous system. This is a monocyte-derived macrophage that's carrying virus into the nervous system. It goes through ion fluxes. It traverses the blood-brain barrier. And then when it gets in, it could uh, secrete cytokines and chemokines, cause a microgliosis, neuronal dropout, astrogliosis, inflammatory response, and disease. So now we made nanoparticles, and we coated them with specific ligands that will target macrophages. This is what it looks like. It's the size and shape of a virus. We inject it. And then within the bloodstream, these nanoparticles containing drugs will find the monocyte. They'll strip off their coat, get into recycling endosomes, and use the macrophage as a carrier vehicle to then transmit the drug rather than the virus to the central nervous system. And this is what would happen. Now there's an inflammatory response. It's driving the monocyte-derived macrophage through the blood-brain barrier. Once it gets in, so instead of transmitting disease, it's secreting drug, anti-inflammatory, neuroprotective, neuroregenerative, and anti-apoptotic medicines that will cure brain disease. And uh, the patient will live for many, many years, travel to Lake Cuomo, and have a wonderful summer. Okay. And that's the idea. So here we're going to give you the, the data that support that 22 and a half second cartoon. So what we've done is we've uh, made and manufactured particles using milling uh, or homogenization or sonication. And we actually can sculpt these particles. Now, does anybody know what, we, what people use milling machines for before they made nano? particulate medicines? Uh, chocolate, chocolate bars. So cosmetics and chocolate bars. But actually, the best chocolate is in Switzerland and Italy. I don't know if you know that. Um, so I figured if this doesn't go well with the grants, I could, you can invite me back and I can make chocolate. I think this would be really good. So we can actually sculpt the nano formulation of the particle uh, and then measure the characterization, which is the size, the charge, the shape of the particle as we sculpt it. We can look at uptake using live cell confocal imaging. Uh, we can then measure retention of the nanoparticle containing drug in the macrophage. We want to do that, uh, want to see that relatively fast. We can measure release of the drug from the macrophage, uh, assess its antiviral, antiretroviral activities in vitro score, and then determine what we move to an animal model for clinical efficacy and ultimately to people. So here's our idea. There are many targets for HIV. We pick the macrophage. And the notion is that these drugs would behave 
similar to the virus. So the macrophage would see the drug particle like it would see a virus. It would get in through clathrin-coated pits, in through recycling endosomes and multivesicular bodies. It would be part of the exosomal network uh, of the cell, so it would be, be secreted by exocytosis, fused with the cell membrane, and be part of the natural machinery that the cell uses for microbial pathogenesis, in this case, for viral therapeutic delivery. Okay, so here's our characterization, and this is what we've done. Uh, do we quiz these students, by the way, or do they take an exam after this course is finished? Okay, there's a slide that I, I really would like you to remember if you do have an exam. So if you can pull out your pens, uh, and, uh, and I want you to copy this. Uh, so you remember everything uh, that's important for this experiment. No, I was only teasing. But this is uh, what we hope to get is really the salient features that we want to ma manufacture uh, this into stable nanoparticles. We want to be able for the macrophage to take the particle up slowly, uh, uh, rapidly, but release it slowly. We want to retain the physical properties and the cell pharmacokinetics for drug delivery, especially to this nervous system. We want to inhibit replication for long periods of time. So instead of taking several pills a day, be able to administer once a week or once a month uh, to improve compliance. And we want to be able to extend release, improve viral inhibition, and even target reservoirs like the nervous system that might be missed by conventional native drug. And our characterization itself uh, took a lot of work, so we able to, uh, the graduate students weren't so happy with this particular part of the experimentation. But the idea is to change the shape and size, so we went from being biologists and neuroimmunologists from physical chemists. So the excipient, the surfactant, the protein structure also becomes very important uh, in, in uh, looking at this as well as the charge. Now, it may seem silly because you heard many lectures on microglial and macrophage uh, secretion. You saw phagocytosis and the relationship in mesenchymal stem cells, regulatory and effector cells, and the immune cascade both in and outside the nervous system. But I don't think you ever learn that the macrophage does not phagocytize everything equally. Everybody know that? I, I didn't know that. But actually, the macrophage likes particles of different sizes and shapes and charges and is able to take them up preferentially. This was actually our first publication in this regard. We used uh, atomic force microscopy, EM and size charge encoding, uptake kinetics, and a variety of technologies to look at what the macrophage would take up and preferentially. We used to look at phagocytosis as something part of a clearance mechanism. Uh, it's something good that the macrophage has. It is an important function. But we never looked at this vis-a-vis -vis biology or physiology regarding drug transport. And we did. So let me take you through this. It's a complex slide. represents several uh, papers. But if you look, these are the drugs on top. I IDV, RTV, ATV, and EVV are uh, protease inhibitors or non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. On the left side, P188, 188 MPEG, those are the surfactants we used uh, in coding uh, the particles or stabilizing the particles. And what we were able to do is to show that the combination of the drug and the excipient uh, govern the shape, size, and charge. And if you look below in yellow and red and green and blue, uh, you can see that ether with adazanavir, that we were able to manufacture particles that had different shapes, that had different charges, and had different interactions vis-a-vis -vis the macrophage. And interestingly enough, the macrophage showed a tremendous avidity if you look at C in the middle scores. And if you look specifically at the rod, which is the long slender rod, the ability of the macrophage to take up rod-shaped particles was almost an order of magnitude greater than those short and fat uh, cuboidal cells. That's why 
Actually, I was a lot heavier. When I saw this experiment, I went on a diet and bought a bicycle, so I wouldn't be... Oh, okay, forget that. But the, the macro... Does everybody understand English or a little bit? I can start. You want to help me with my Italian? <laughs> okay. But it, there was a proclivity in terms of the size and the shape, and the more we were able to get the particles in based on these dynamics would mean what? Would mean the ability of the macrophage to store and transport these particles. So we developed a scheme of entry, of release, and then on the bottom middle panel, right uh, dead center, of antiretroviral responses that we could develop the magic or the best particle that could be carried by the macrophage. And then when we looked, we wanted to quantitate this, so we di used different uh, fluorophores and colors, and the drugs were labeled with different colors, the particles were labeled, and we were able then, by using chlorometric systems, determine how much of each drug would be taken up and carried into the macrophage. Now, the, the main uh, issue after we were able to make these long rods uh, and particles that were actively taken up is how can we even improve this further? Can we coat these particles with specific ligands, with specific sugars that will make it more attractive? So the idea was to actually take a donut. I don't know how many people like donuts, but uh, if you have a donut that's a jelly donut and has sugar on top, it may be a little more tasty. So in this case, we're targeting uh, receptors of the macrophage so we could theoretically use the FC-mediated mechanism as well as specifically targeted ligands on these nanoparticles to allow more efficient uptake. In this case, we're looking at folic acid. Now, why were we interested in folate? Because it's related uh, and linked to macrophage activation. And since viral infection is linked to activation, we reasoned that we can coat particles with specific ligands or sugars that would be present on an infected macrophage vis-a-vis -vis activation and allow these particles to gain entry much more efficiently based on the repertoire of cellular proteins that are affected during the course of activation, whether it be LPS, interferon gamma, TNF, IL-1, or whatever, to actually generate a proclivity of particle coatings that would allow the particles more efficient entry. The other part is actually use specific block copolymers in our excipients that would generate a more uniformity of these long slender rods with the right coating combinations that would be the best meal, so to speak, for the macrophage as a carrier system. And we used uh, very popular click reactions that were allowed us to generate high yields, functional groups, all reactions, and were worked up relatively simply so we can move these, these different ligands interchangeably and find out what might be the most effective for cell carriage capacity. In this case, we use mannose as a targeting ligand, and uh, what we're developing now, or new targeting being developed, are particular chemotactic proteins or chemotactic ligands in the sense that we can use the particle as a chemoattractant for the macrophage rather than the particle going after the macrophage, the macrophage actually going after the particle. So we're really developing a diverse set of array of different approaches uh, for targeting macrophage-based delivery. Am I finished? Okay. 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 Oh, that's, that's me. That's me. It's, uh, it could be. I always, yeah. The problem is I don't think the powers would be like my silly jokes. I think they're telling me uh, this is haunted. I, actually, because Italy is such a, an older country, not that it's old, everybody's young. Um, people might be saying, you know, you gotta be careful what you say here. I don't know. <laughs> the other part of this is to use existing networks vis-a-vis uh, -vis exosomes that are secreted to actually enhance the system. So natural means for targeting, and we're going to hear more about this, the exosome uh, component for CNS drug delivery or CNS delivery 
of antigens or immune modifiers is clearly just in its infancy. Okay, so let's talk about what's wrong? No problem. I, uh, is that better? Okay. I hope I wasn't, you know, messing people up. Okay. So here's the deal. Um, what we're, this is kind of our late stage, and hopefully I, I try to put it together. First is to manufacture the particle, to improve its size, shape, delivery. Talked about long, slender rods and the efficiency of uptake. Then I talked a little bit about coating machineries. And now I'm talking about taking that even one step further and using natural vehicles that the macrophage has vis-a-vis -vis exosomes to enhance entry. So these are the ways in which we're targeting or developing. The exosomes, I think, are clearly the most exciting part, uh, mainly because uh, they're relatively efficient. They could be made in large numbers, and they could be done naturally. And in this case, uh, CHIMP1, Venuclein, Talon, RAB11, we can isolate endosomes or exosomes dependent on protein content relatively easy by immunoaffinity chromatography and actually look by proteomic analysis. In this case, we can take these individual isolated exosomes and do and uh, determine the proteome, their cytokine content. But these exosomes are, are extraordinarily bioactive. And I think I'm not finished with this because I'm just kind of putting this out in the sense of we're a student audience and trying to look not only in the present but into the future that these bioactive vehicles are going to be much more seen, I believe, for all cases of delivery vehicles uh, in, the, in the time to come. Rather than hours to get in, the exosomes can get into macrophage within minutes. Uh, they can distribute relatively rapidly, and they can enter into the particles uh, that are recycling in nature. So we wanted to then determine if all that is right, Dr. Gendelman. That's all right. I got a big mouth. You know, one time I was giving a lecture, I'll never forget this, I, I was in France, and, and I was really struggling because uh, I wanted to speak a, li a little bit in, in French. I, don't, you'll pardon me, I don't know any Italian, I know a little bit of French. And, uh, and my, my phone goes off. And I said, who's, so I didn't answer it. You know, it's, I forgot to turn it off, you know, when the thing goes on. Sometimes it happens. But it kept ringing, kept ringing and ringing, and I, I really um, finally answered it. I thought, you know, this is really embarrassing, I'm giving a lecture. And it was my mother, it was my mother. <laughs> so my mother called, no, it's true, it's actually a true story. So my mother called, and she was starting to scream at me. She said, you know, you hadn't called in a month. <laughs> What's going on? I said, Mom, like, I'm giving this lecture. And she said, I don't care what you're doing. You know, mothers are important. So she just reminded me. But uh, I think the, the, um, the, the microphone is also important, if you can hear it. But what we had to do, I think, in all of this, and I, I look at a macrophage, as a, a vehicle, a caring vehicle. It's not really your mother, uh, but the macrophage, uh, to my mind, is kind of like my mother. And, and I'll tell you why. Because unlike any other cell, and you laugh because you probably study lymphocytes, and you say because it has all the cell surface repertoires and subsets, and come on, the macrophages are very primitive. They're primitive cells. How could that be a mother? But the truth is, that the macrophage has an incredible number of functions and repertoires. It can do a lot of things more than a lymphocyte, much more than a lymphocyte can do vis-a-vis uh, -vis functions. It has nutritive functions. It has transportory functions. It, it can present antigens. It can communicate with other cells. It really is a central clearinghouse and orchestrator of the immune system more than any other uh, cell, to my knowledge. Uh, in terms of what it can do. And in harnessing this capability could be used in, for therapeutic advantage. That's why uh, we're presenting this lecture, uh, even though it's a relatively early concept for disease. So what we wanted to look at 
is how do the macrophage take up the nanoparticles? How are they trafficked? Where are they stored? How are they released? And we thought early on that this was incredibly important because we wanted to manufacture this particle, this long slender rod that was coated that might be part of the exosomal process. We wanted it to bypass the lysosomal degradation. You talked about uh, uh, the uh, lysozymes or a lysosomal or enzymatic network so it would not be destroyed. You want it to be stable within the cell and you wanted it to be secreted wh where? When the macrophage gains entry into an end organ like the brain and at that point the drug would be dissociated. So it really had to have a number of properties and we, we really reasoned that that property had to reside in endosomes and specifically recycling endosomes. Why? Because that endocytic compartment would be continuously evolved and allow the cell to secrete that particle as an intact drug over time. So that was our intracellular uh, destination machinery. And what we had to do first is to bypass conventional receptors, get it into clathrin-coated uh, uh, pits. And we did that by using in the methicin or dinosaur to block uh, conventional mechanisms and then ultimately determine that the early mechanisms would be these early endosomes or endosomal structures. So let's kind of go through how we did this. What we did is, a, I like this because it's a very simple experiment. Simple experiments are the most exciting of all. So we made these formulations, just like I told you we did with the milling, with the drug, with the sculpting of the size and shape and the coating mechanisms, we allowed it to undergo cycles in the macrophage so there was a mixture of networks. We then labeled it with brilliant blue so it was permanently labeled. That means the label itself didn't uh, label any cellular uh, lipid structures, only the nanoparticle itself. And then we fed it to a, nano, to a macrophage. The contiguous structures were labeled. Right? So we had the particle and whatever structure that particle was in. We made a lysate. We ran it through a sucrose gradient, so we separate it based on size. And then the size fractions we cut out. We took those cutouts and then we sequenced or we subjected that to tandem mass spectrometry and determined the protein content and the protein identification in those bands that we saw from the sucrose gradient. Now, why did we do all this? I told you it was a simple experiment. What we're trying to do is to find out where in the cell those particles were. And if they, weren't, if they were in lysosomes or the endoplasmic reticulum, the game was up because we wouldn't have anything that would be stable. So we wanted to work this, uh, this technique through so the majority of the particles would be in stable structures that the virus or the macrophage would use to grow the virus. And that's exactly what we were able to do. So this was a lot of work uh, kind of condensed in a simple pie diagram which used the thousands of proteins that we were able to identify the subcellular structures. And what we were able to see that 22% of our best particles did make it to recycling endosomes, 24% ended up into early endosomes, and these were stable structures. These were structures that the particles can reside in for months, not days, but months. And these were, these were structures that theoretically, at least, the virus can be, or the particle could be dissociated and free drug could be released once the macrophage entered the brain or any other end organ tissue. So the question was, that's great and wonderful, Dr. Gendelman, but prove it. Show me. Show me the, uh, the proof that this is right. Great that you did mass spectrometry, but what we did to try to prove it is we went to conventional confocal microscopy. So the idea, if we labeled the particle in red, we fluorescinated the, a red particle, and then we went ahead in green, labeled the recycling and the early endosomes, the endosomal particles, if we had them in the particle or the, those structures that we hoped they would target, it should turn what? It should turn yellow or red or orange. 
because of the co-localization. That's exactly what happened. The cytoplasm, or these particles, became yellow and orange. So there was co-localization in exactly targeting these recycling and early endosomal structures. The other thing we did is we looked at the particles uh, outside into lysozymes or later endosomes or late endosomes, and you can see in the merge figure on the bottom, there was very little. And we bothered to quantitate that uh, difference, and you can see vis-a-vis -vis the recycling endosomal particles, the RAB8, 11, and 14, is predominantly where the particles resided, and the other components were much less, the RAB7 or the LAMP1. But that wasn't enough. What we ultimately wanted to do is to prove, using specific antibodies, that this is where the drug was. One thing to show the particle, but show me the drug in the particle in these uh, endocytic structures. So what we did this is we loaded uh, the antiretroviral particles, lysed. We did the endocytic gradients. In this case, we used magnetic beads. So we actually had iron that would accumulate. We could stain the iron. We then looked at the compartment complexes, and then we validated those complexes by conventional HPLC looking for the drug. And when we did that, and this is exactly what was done, uh, the endocytic structures, sucrose gradient, uh, immunoaffinity chromatography, and HPLC, as you can see early on, the iron, which is labeled in white, is stained, was exactly where the RAB11 uh, was located. And ultimately, when we looked at the distribution of the particles in the macrophage, one could see that the particles remained intact and only dissolved over time, slowly, over a period of weeks. When we investigated the antiretroviral properties, we looked at free drug or just HIV alone in the middle. Brown means a viral antigen. Big giant cells mean fusion and cytopathicity. You can see that the ritonavir nanoparticles or the released nanoparticles was able to prevent viral growth up to a period of a month while the free drug was clear of breakthrough. So the idea that we can take particles and get them through uh, clathrin-coated vesicles, we can then look and inhibit them uh, by drugs or by uh, uh, mechanisms to inhibit the endocytic vesicles from forming de novo and uh, target specifically not the late endosomes or the RAB7 lysozymes or the secretory lysosomes. Uh, this is what we wanted to prevent, but get them in in green to the fast recycling, early recycling endosomes, and most important, the endocytic recycling compartments because we had a means right now to intracellularly target a uh, drug where the virus was, in fact, replicating. So in summary, uh, we can get uh, particles in, we can prevent degradation, we can alter their secretion, and we had a vehicle system to actually study and develop these nanoformulations. So really, the, the question that was before us was how can we then translate all these in vitro findings to an in vivo system. In this case, we wanted to determine pharmacokinetics, tissue distribution, and nanoformulations of the drug. This was the before we do any kind of fancy neuroimmune pharmacology and target the brain and animal model systems. We had to show that we had a superior system from what was out there. So how did we do this? We took normal animals, right? And we then developed a paradigm based on all our in vitro experiments, the uptake, retention, release, antiviral efficacy. We scored it. We picked our best, which are in green, our worst in red. We picked the best particles. We used them alone in combination to do some very simple pharmacokinetic tests. This is kind of uh, pharmacology 101. And I, I love to show this slide. Why? because I'm chair of a very large pharmacology department, 180 people, that's a lot, even for America, and I'm not a pharmacologist. So I remember uh, when they were deciding whether they would take an immunologist or a neuroimmunologist, 
and the dean called me into his office, and he said, um, I'm really sorry to tell you, but uh, I'm not sure we can give you another job, and I know uh, you want uh, opportunities to grow your program and people, and uh, I don't know how it's going to work out. We do have the pharmacology department open, but you don't know any pharmacology, and quite frankly, I would give it to you, but you got to go to somewhere in Philadelphia and take a course in pharmacology, so at least you know something about pharmacology, uh, and that seems reasonable, because why? Because if you're going to head the major department in the medical center, you have to at least spell the word pharmacology and know what pharmacology is. Okay, so I felt this was embarrassing. You take a professor and a distinguished professor and you make him take a graduate level course 101 in the, uh, in the position that he's chairman of the department, this would be uh, not a good thing. It could be embarrassed. So I thought about maybe wearing a mask. Um, so I got a President Bush mask. It didn't fit, and Obama wasn't around at that time, so I couldn't disguise myself. I thought maybe if I grow a beard, Steve still would recognize me. Um, so I figured out how to get out of it. I said, why don't we just change the department? Instead of calling it the Department of Pharmacology, why don't we call it the Department of Neuroimmune Pharmacology, since I'm a neuroimmunologist, and I'll go ahead and I'll write the first textbook of neuroimmune pharmacology. We'll teach a course, and we even may start a new journal of neuroimmune pharmacology. Nobody knows what that is, so it probably will be very popular. So the dean uh, looks at me. He said, you're crazy. You're absolutely nuts. Why? There's no journal. There's no book. I said, don't worry, we'll do it. So a year later, we wrote a big textbook. We started a big journal, very successful. And he comes back to me. He said, well, you, did you learn any pharmacology? I said, no, but I look really important because I'm running this journal. So we did our first exp That's supposed to be fun. It's actually, it's a true story, by the way. <laughs> it should be funny. I don't know. Maybe it wasn't funny at the time. But I could tell years later, it's... It's kind of a funny story. But anyway, um, uh, what we did was fundamental pharmacology. So what we're trying to do is look at the half-life of the drug, the single injection, and uh, enter into the pharmacodynamics. And what we're asking here, do we have a superior preparation from what was out there before? So in blue is the native drug. This is a log scale. So our limits of detection are about 10 nanograms per mil, maybe a little bit less in our UPLC assay. The ED50, which is the effective dose 50 in humans, is about 100 to 150 nanograms per mil. Uh, efavirenz is at the bottom, ritonavir and atazanavir. And you can see that uh, a single dose at the lowest possible dose of 10 megs per kg, uh, which is about what we give a single oral dose that the ED50 for four days or longer was maintained. So we knew doing a very simple assay or a pharmacokinetic parameters that we had a superior product. That was uh, question number one. Second question was, so the nano art provided sustained serum levels through four days. It provided higher and more sustained tissue levels than the nano uh, art or the nano efavirenz. So the second question was the dosing will provide the serum concentrations equivalent to the human therapeutic uh, levels that we were trying to achieve. So in this case, we're now dosing the animals every week, right? And why we're doing every week? Because that was what we believed to be achievable, right? So we had a four-day half-life. We're doing a boost and then a weekly injection uh, weekly. I mean, every seven days or every week, obviously the same thing. And then we looked at the serum levels of whether they could be sustained. And when we did that, we saw a very nice dose response. And we were able then, on the higher dose, in this case we're doing up to 250, 150 megs, which is tenfold or more higher that would easily be uh, administered in a human in these mice, uh, we were able to achieve 
up to 400 nanograms per mil of the drug over a period of two weeks. So in this case, and the drug levels were three orders of magnitude higher than what we would see with a native drug. So we were onto something that we believed important. But we couldn't stop there. Uh, what the perennial question always was in any new formulation, in macrophage delivery or nanotechnology, is nanotoxicology. So here are the uh, liver enzymes, kidney functions, uh, metabolic functions, serum albumin and, and electrolytes uh, for these animals that were treated. And I remember giving these enzymatic levels to, um, to the lab. I, I just love this day because we didn't have the machines to do mouse electrolytes and mouse renal function. So I put my name on the, on the slip, the serum slip of the mouse, right? The Howard Gendelman, and it went to the, uh, uh, to the laboratory, and I got a frantic call because there's enzymatic differences between a human and a mouse. <laughs> Dr. Gendelman, we're really sorry to inform you, but you're dead <laughs> because your magnesium levels and your phosphate levels are really totally out of whack. <laughs> and I said, that's, just, that's really weird because I'm still alive. I'm talking to you. <laughs> but um, then the head of the laboratory called me up, and he wasn't amused. So we did get a machine to measure this. Uh, but they were normal, by the way. Normal for a mouse, not normal for Howie. Uh, and we did the histopathology, which is also normal. Uh, and these were kind of the basic bread and butter of the nanoformulations that we had developed. The dosing chemistry, again, provided adequate levels resulted in uh, drug levels that were quite a bit higher in tissue, and there was no toxicity evident by serum chemistry and serum chemistry profiles. So the, really, the most important question next is how we can translate this into a mouse. Now, the problem with uh, generating a mouse model for HIV is that HIV doesn't infect mouse cells. So you have to generate some kind of reconstitution or some kind of humanization. Uh, in this case, we did a bone marrow transplant. Uh, and what we did is we took human cord blood or human fetal tissue, but mostly we used cord blood. And we were able to do intrahepatic injections, repopulate the liver early stage after radiation in uh, double rag knockout. So these are immunodeficient animals. And we were able to get a number of stem cells implanted human stem cells into a mouse and regenerate uh, or repopulate uh, the mouse with the human immune system. We, we did that successfully. But even before, we did some very simple experiments of using adult human uh, peripheral blood lymphocytes as a simple reconstitution. And these experiments were three or four weeks. The brown or DR, these are the human reconstituted lymph node, brain, spleen, intestine. And then we really did uh, a number of experiments, either pre-exposure prophylaxis or acute infection. Now, in pre-exposure prophylaxis, this is the idea that we do what? That we treat first and give the virus later. So this is something that's being developed throughout the world, especially in the developing world, as a, as a mechanism, sort of a, a vaccine, uh, to prevent viral disease. So this is what we do. We repopulate the animals with adult peripheral blood lymphocytes. These are immunodeficient animals. We treat first with a nano antiretroviral drug and then uh, challenge the animals with HIV and look at the differences between native drug and the nano uh, art. And in native drug in blue, the nano art in red, you can clearly see the differences in tissue levels uh, that we can easily see by day nine, even using very high levels of oral drugs they're, they're gone uh, within a week or later, and they're quite sustained tissue levels uh, in these nanoformulated drug regimens. When one looks at the uh, level of suppression, we can also prevent and suppress HIV replication. When we look at chronic infection, in this case, we constitute the animals, infect them with HIV the next day, um, uh, treat them with nano art, measure serum and distribution levels as we've done before. Uh, in this case, look at therapeutic uh, drug levels, entry into lymphatic tissues, and antiretroviral efficacy. 
This is our toxicology profiles, our histology profiles, all are normal other than the uh, sine qua non of infiltrating human cells in the reticular endothelial system. But most importantly, we were able to achieve relatively high levels of drug both in the sera and in the tissue in the infected animals, the acutely infected animals. But even more importantly, uh, we were able to do what? For the first time, protect CD4 positive T cells. You can see on the right up are HIV infected controls and CD4 uh, cells in the, in the right quadrant compared to the nano R treated, which were relatively normal, both in the spleen and the, and the blood and the CD4, uh, CD8 ratios, which were protected. But even more importantly, we were able to uh, reduce the viral load levels, both in tissue and in serum, to nearly undetectable levels. So this is where we were with the acute infection. And again, uh, serum levels were 14 days, exceeded those at six, beyond the human uh, ED50, uh, though the brain was uh, lower than the limit of detection. The spleen was tenfold higher. The CD4 counts were preserved. The combination suppressed HIV replication and that we were uh, uh, inhibiting any type of secondary toxicity. So we then really wanted to move this technology to what I just said, to have a permanent humanized mouse that we can measure chronic infection over months rather than over days. So this is what we did. There were a number of groups throughout the world that were other than us have developed these systems. And this is the history of the humanized mouse systems for HIV infection. Uh, we were the first uh, to develop this system for uh, multi-organ disease and the first to show that uh, these animals develop spontaneous neurological disease. And this is what we did. I just told you this. We take uh, newborn animals, uh, intrahepatic injections. Uh, that follows by bone marrow reconstitution, thymic reconstitution. And we end up with a truly humanized mouse, uh, which has a functional human immune system. These animals will have this immune system for over a year. So we can then manipulate and look at therapeutic efficacy over this period of time. This is the animal, this is the injection, and these are the human uh, progenitor cells, the bone marrow progenitor cells that will uh, evolve over a period of weeks. And these are bone marrow uh, hematopoietic uh, human precursors that we've seen, as well as what we see in the thymus and T cells uh, and lymphatic structures. When we look at these animals vis-a-vis uh, -vis infection, we published uh, a whole bunch of papers on this in the last couple of years. We can see, again, the, the lymph nodes, the mesenterial lymph nodes, uh, that they're repopulated by human immune cells. These cells will be infected with HIV. You can see HIV P24, uh, HLA-DR, and KI-67, a rapid turnover of uh, positive cells. So this is what we did in these experiments. These animals were chronically infected now for two months and then gave them weekly injections. So similar to what we would do in a human over a period of several weeks. And the first question we want to ask, since these animals will develop viral loads of 10 to the fifth, very persistent, can we reduce these viral loads to really undetectable levels similar to what we had seen previously uh, with native drug given two or three times a day by Gavage. So this was, again, I, I, I'll stop and pause because these are the kinds of experiments that you see once every four or five years and you get really excited. It worked. Uh, weekly injections, which were very different than every eight hour uh, injections or institutions, were able to reduce the viral load in green where the replicate untreated animals, and you can see the viral load was 10 to the fifth. It sustained the nano R treated animals, uh, did show uh, viral loads that were reduced to baseline. When we stopped the drug, we thought maybe we could even cure these animals because the particles were getting into these reservoirs. Not yet. After three weeks of cessation, the viral load uh, increased, as we've seen in humans. We were able to protect the numbers of CD4 positive T cells in red compared to green, 
uh, CD45 were not affected, CD3 were only partially infected. And then we looked in the lymph nodes, uh, we did see some viral infected cells. Um, uh, the cervical lymph nodes had very few, the spleen had none. And we're working on formulations that we believe can get into these lymph node follicles even more efficiently. So uh, the possibility is reduce the viral levels even lower than what we were able to achieve here. This is the thymus. Again, the spleen uh, nearly at baseline levels compared to the DR, which are uh, the human cells that are present but not uh, HIV infected. These uh, corresponded to high levels of, of drug. In this case, uh, the sera levels or the liver levels were clearly beyond uh, the ED50 uh, that we had for humans. And then we can show that by those high levels of drug really reflected what we believe, and we're, we're sorting this out now, that the macrophage reservoir for the nanoparticle will increase over successive doses. So if we give one dose, two dose, three doses, each time we give a dose, uh, uh, the, viral, the antiretroviral levels will increase to a plateau. And then obviously we stop the drug, it will reduce to zero. And we believe that's happening because the particles are activating the macrophage and changing its phagocytic capability. We're investigating that right now and have some evidence for it. The toxicology profiles uh, were only effective uh, the only toxicology that we did see were low levels of albumin and a prerenal uh, infection. In this case, this was due to the virus, not to the therapy, and these animals were infected with an enterococcus. So it, there really was no toxicity. It was a secondary bacterial infection, as we know now. I just got the email this morning, actually, what happened to these kidneys. So uh, that's good for we haven't submitted those papers yet. The summary of this, that the viral loads were reduced, uh, detectable, the administration loss, uh, prevented the loss of human CD4 cells. Uh, there was no toxicity associated with six weekly treatments, and we we're uh, doing even more drug quantitations in the serum, which are ongoing. Okay, so where do we go now? What do we, what, where do we want to be uh, if you ever have me come back uh, 10 years from now? Hopefully, I'll be back sooner. I have to come with my wife, you know. I mean, this is, you know, oh, n not my wife, my girl. I don't have a girlfriend, so I don't know. <laughs> okay. I don't know what the hand signals go. That means I got to stop talking, but I got a few more minutes. Um, but I want to talk about the future of this field because I, I really do believe that this has legs. This is kind of early on. Within the next couple years, we'll, we're moving this to monkeys, and eventually we'll uh, within a uh, year or two, we'll do uh, clinical trials, and we hope we'll bring these drugs to the market, uh, uh, certainly. But where can this field go vis-a-vis uh, -vis neuroimmune pharmacology? Where, where can we improve what we're doing? Well, it's kind of an, a unique system, so we reason that we can also use this for thoronostics. Anybody know what thoronostics are? Okay, that's good, because we just started the Journal of Theronostics, so you should be submitting papers very soon if you don't know what it is. That's good. I didn't know what pharmacology was, and I'm giving this lecture. So, uh, but Theronostics is a relatively new field, and that combines uh, diagnostics and therapy. So we call it Theronostics, diagnostics and therapy. So what we want to do is do imaging in vivo, uh, monitor treatment response, and do multitasking nanomaterials. So what is that? Be? Well, let me take it. Let me try to make this uh, intelligible. Let me give you a model. And I got to use my hand. This is the part my great great grandfather used to stop and start touching things. Okay. But um, I really did want to give you a good show. Here. <laughs> I failed miserably. My mother, you know, it's a problem. Because he takes care of patients. 
because you went to medical school, you did the residency, I'm still paying your bills. I said, Mom, I paid for it. She said, well, it was emotional pain. <laughs> and you're not, you don't even have a practice. What's going on? So she still brings that up to me 30 years later. She still brings that up to me. I mean, it's a terrible, isn't that awful? I mean, if you're a mother, you would be complaining too. So theranostics, again, and macrophages, I, and I'm teasing. an MRI image, then we would be able uh, to both transmit a drug and iron at the same time to be able to image a biodistribution or pharmacokinetics by uh, MRI. So that's the idea. So the way we did this by looking at sp uh, SPIONs or uh, spones and theranostics, but the idea is to take super paramagnetic oxide nanoparticles, which you hear, you heard of this before? Nobody heard of this. Well, of course, you're a doctor. You know, you know about all this stuff. Come on, come on. You know, just because you're not practicing, everybody, no, you know what an MRI is, right? Magnetic resonance imaging. What? Yeah, 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 yeah. So the idea is that these are here that have a, a limited toxicity, and then they can be functionalized with drugs and bioactive agents and the same kind of peptide or targeting ligand. So you have the drug, right? You have the iron. You then have the excipient or the polymer. And then on top, you have the ligand. So you have a targeting mechanism to bring that into a certain cell or a tissue. And that will determine, because the drug is in that, labeled into that uh, magnet or the, into the iron, what the distribution would be just by doing conventional MRI over time. So that's the idea behind it. So the macrophage and theranostics are the abilities to uptake, store, and release nanoformulated drug, just like we've done before, that we can use macrophages because they're highly mobile, they migrate across impermeable barriers and release the drug cargo at sites of injury, and they slowly release the antiretroviral drugs. So what we developed is a system called flash precipitation. Now, we had to use flash precipitation because we're bringing in a lot of moieties together at one set time. So we bring this all in, and we flash precipitate it, very similar to making ice cream. Anybody make ice cream here? Well, if you know how to make ice cream, you can actually make these theranostic drugs. They're very, very similar, uh, just like making chocolate, right? No, <laughs> you make ice cream. So again, I can make ice cream and chocolate. I'm ready to go. But they're relatively uh, energy volume, high loading capacity, and continuous, and they're relatively re reproducible, reproducible, but they're also scalable, so we can have this uh, together. The spone and our particles are actually in the outlet, and this is what they look like. So this is a uh, PE10, PLD30 as a novel coding system, and I'll tell you what we happen. First, we make the spawn that has the antiretroviral drug, and the TM image was we coat it with the polymer that we're going to be using. We analyze that by electron microscopy, and you can actually see the size and shape, which is very similar to what we would use without the iron contained within it. And then we move this to bring the antiretroviral drug into the iron core. So this is the PLGA, or we could use any kind of polymer. The ATV is the antiretroviral drug, or the RTV, and we can use more than one drug in these polymers. We use emulsion and sonification, so now we're able to bring in, in blue, the iron, in red, uh, the antiretroviral drugs. We evaporate it by organ solvent sonification. We then bring the PEG foil 
as part of the coding or the coding ligands. And then we have a particle that has a specific ligand that has the iron, that has the shape and the size as a targeting moiety that we can use for biomedical, uh, for biomedical research and drug distribution. Okay, and what we see is the PDI or the dispersity is very simple. So all the particles actually are the same size and shape. So we can make particles exactly what we want to do. All of those are slender rise and exactly the size and shape. We don't have to do any milling uh, per se on this. Uh, and then we can uh, do that uh, even more complicated because we can bring in uh, whatever targeting ligands we want and whatever drugs we want in whatever combination we want within these uh, flash precipitation methods. And then what do we do? Well, once we make these, then we go to our MRI. Now, we're lucky we have our, our own MRI. This is a 7 Tesla mouse magnet. And we can measure uh, diffusion tensor imaging and brain distribution. And that's essentially what we've been doing. So we go ahead and we feed the animals the particles in the face of antiretroviral therapy. And these animals are humanized mice. I'm almost finished. I want to get to the punchline. So here, let me go through what we did. OK, so here's an animal, right? It's a lot of stuff. So I get a headache just saying it through. But we actually did all this. So these animals were grown, right, propagated. And they were immunodeficient, right? So we had to uh, take care and be very cautious of what we did. We then ran over to the OB-GYN clinic, took a couple placentas of babies that were born that night, isolated the cord blood, and did a, essentially a bone marrow transplant, human and mouse. Let that go, and then after 20 to 30 weeks, after the human stem cells had taken root, we then infected the animals with HIV. Two months they were infected, three months after that, so now it's five months, we saw a neurological disease. So half of the animals will develop spontaneous neurological disease. And then we did uh, cortical structures that we did DTI, MRSI, and we can measure, short of doing histopathology, we can actually measure changes in metabolites that will give us some indication of what they were seeing with uh, a change in NAA, which reflects neuronal aberrations. At the same time, we're using measurements of fractional and isotropy, uh, mean diffusivity and, and, uh, and transverse, as well as longitudinal changes. And we can generate a three-dimensional picture of the entire brain of the mouse. So we actually can see histopathology and then treat these animals uh, and then monitor drug distribution and effects on the brain. Now, I'm, I'm very, very sad to say uh, I had all this when I was going down to Italy, and uh, I forgot to load these slides. But we do have two slides, so I'm going to have to tell you what they are, and this is my apologies. They're really such fresh. We just did these experiments. I don't think anyone would be crazy enough to do these experiments, so I'm not worried about anybody uh, doing the same thing. But suffice to say that we can actually change the NAA profiles, the metabolic profiles non-invasively, and we can look by the changes in mean disaffinity as well as conventional MRI and actually show drug distribution. So this does work. Uh, we have a long way to go, a really long way to go, to bring this into some kind of reproducible fashion. But I suspect the idea of theranostics, especially in distribution within the brain and brain subregions, whether it be antiretroviral or neuroprotective or vaccine or even stem cells, uh, we're going to hear a lot more about it in the time to come. So in summary, uh, we've made nanoformulations. We've been able to generate uh, uh, relatively high levels of drug levels, prevent uh, viral infection, actually reverse CNS disease, and be able to use this in the next generation in what we call theranostics to bring neuroimmune pharmacology to a very different level where we actually do imaging and, and therapeutics in a single scale. OK, so I'll, um, I think I'll stop. Uh, I talk too much and leave it open for questions.